The idea that the dollar going up versus other fiat does not impact a portfolio because they're all getting debased is completely wrong. Welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast, where we untangle market and policy complexity using timeless economic principles. For show notes and archives, go to goldexchangepodcast.com. Now, on to today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Gold Exchange Podcast. I'm your host, Dixon Buchanan, and I'm joined, as always, by the founder and CEO of Monetary Metals, Keith Weiner. Today, we're very pleased to have on the show Brent Johnson. Brent is the CEO of Santiago Capital, a private wealth management firm based in Puerto Rico. Brent is also the CEO of the dollar milkshake theory. I'm just kidding. He's not really the CEO of the dollar milkshake theory. But uh, as far as uh, uh, as synonyms go, I would say Brent Johnson and the dollar milkshake theory are, are pretty much synonyms at this point. Um you may know him for, as the, for, for better or worse. I think for that's better or worse, right? We'll, we'll, we'll see. How, we'll see how it all works out. Right, right. Um, so we plan to get into to everything dollar milkshake uh, in this episode, but I want to just, um, you know, before we get started, I, I want to just note briefly that it's a pretty rare phenomenon to have two gold proponents, uh, you know, pro pro gold, gold bulls, if you will who are at the same time dollar bulls, or at the very least think the dollar is gonna get a whole lot stronger before, before it gives up the ghost. So I'd love for, for both of you to kind of unpack, you know, your positions there and, and the reasons why you, you, you kind of maintain that thesis. But um, yeah, let's, let's start with, uh, with well, let me just say first, Brent, welcome to the show. We're very glad to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. And I always enjoy speaking with you guys. Um, you know, I think Keith is one of the smarter, if not the smartest guy I know in the gold world. So I always appreciate his work. And I like it that he's, you know, kind of keeps an open mind and understands how the monetary system works. So it's, it's always fun to have these conversations. Thanks, Brent. The, the one thing I just want to say as preface, and I'll, I'll let Brent do most of the answering of the, of the question, is that um, a big theme in my work is perverse incentive, incentives and, and also perverse designs. And to say, you know, uh, I'm bullish on the dollar, I, I could quibble with that, the accuracy of that slightly, but, you know, to say that the dollar is, you know, going to get stronger, which I've been saying for a long, long time, relative as, me as measured in euros and pounds and other currencies like that, isn't to say, yeah, America, um, which, which is an easy assumption for people to make. Rather, it's to say, the system is designed the way it is. It's not designed the way it isn't or the way everybody imagines it to be. It's very perverse. Like all the mechanics that um, you know we're gonna talk about is, 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 it's not good, but you have to recognize reality. It is what it is. It works the way it works, doesn't work the way it doesn't work. And um, yeah. I think that's a really important preface. Uh, I, I, I'm not gonna speak for Brent, but I'm gonna guess that he's not an advocate for it being designed this way, uh, but it's designed this way for, for whatever reasons, which we can talk about historically. And because it's designed this way, then it behaves this way. And because it behaves this way, you know, you either get it or you don't get it. And um, I, I think, you know, Brent, more than almost any other single human being has been out there trying to, uh, you know, reach out to people and help, help them understand this is how it is. Um, yeah. And that's what <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. And I'm, I'm I mean, sure, really, you know, my, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm sure, go ahead, sorry. I'm sure I, I, I've got the t-shirt, you know, been there, done that, got the t-shirt for pissing off a lot of people in the gold community <laughs> by trying to say, look, this market works by arbitrage, not by naked shorting and manipulation. I'm sure, yeah. you know, you could say been there, done there, got that, the t-shirt for pissing off a lot of people saying, you know, milkshake and, and you know, dollar bowl. For the same yeah. reason, which is, you know, sometimes people have their comforting um, illusions. <clears throat> and if you take that away, you know, take that away at your own peril. They lash out you, they get furious and, um, you know, there's nothing, nothing good about that. Yeah. But anyways, let me uh, let Brent, um, you know, answer and, and uh, take it where you will. Yeah, I think the, the most important point that you just touched on and that I will second here, and I hope everybody you know, takes us to heart is that recognition is not the same thing as advocacy, right? 
here, just here. because you just because you recognize something being the way it is does not mean that you're a fan of it does not mean that you would do it the same way does not mean that you think it should be that way it's just recognizing that it is right and um i i, I feel like uh, many people in the gold world and perhaps this is it's fine i don't have a problem with them doing this but just recognize what you're doing. And I think that many people in the gold world are, for lack of a better word, financial justice warriors. And a friend of mine coined that term, I don't know, four or five years ago, and I thought it fit perfectly. Uh, you know, a lot of them are out there advocating for a better system, maybe a more moral system, maybe a perhaps more fair system, however you want to describe it. And that's fine. I don't have any problem with anybody advocating for what they believe is right. But when you then start telling people to invest or place their money or allocate capital or make decisions of their life based on what you think should happen rather than what is actually going to happen based on the design of the system in the real world, that's where I start to have a little bit of a problem with it. And so, um, you know, when I kind of really first dug into the monetary system was 15 years ago, 2006, 2007 timeframe. Luckily, I started doing it prior to the global financial crisis. And that led me to be a big advocate for gold because I recognize that the system is inherently unstable. And then as I got further into it, let's call it five, six, seven years later, kind of middle, maybe 2015, 16 timeframe, you know, I thought that gold should have gone up. I was a I was a financial justice warrior from let's call it 2009 to 2015. I would put myself in that camp that I was a financial justice warrior, and I couldn't figure out why gold wasn't going up. And all my other friends in the gold world were saying, "Oh, just give it time. It will. It will." And I kept saying, "But why hasn't it?" And no, nobody wanted to address the question, the, the answer, and nobody else wanted to say we got it wrong. And I, I was like, "We have to say we got it wrong." because we did, right? And so, and so I finally just got tired of asking all my friends in the gold world to help me figure it out. And I kind of just decided to figure it out on my own. And listen, there's a question of whether or not I figured it out or not, but, but what I discovered in my own search for, you know, why the gold didn't work is I really kind of dug into the monetary system again. And that's when I kind of Perhaps I should have known this all along, but I didn't. I kind of figured out that the game is to a certain extent rigged in favor of the dollar. And based on the design of the system, the dollar is not going to get inflated away, at least not before all the other currencies get inflated away. Mm. Um, and when I, when I remember the day I, well, it didn't, it didn't happen in one day. This was a very long process. But I remember the day that I finally came to the realization, again, realization versus advocacy. Um, I knew I was right, or I had a very high conviction I was right because I hated the answer. I hated it. I did, not <laughs> want, I did not want to come to this conclusion. But there it was, right? And so, so then I was like, holy cow, I need to do even... So then I did even more work on it and, and everything... You know, again, I didn't want to be right. I wanted to find a flaw in this and, and I couldn't, I really couldn't. And so that's when I tried as best possible. And I think I, I that's what, and that's what I continue to do is not so much tell, I don't want necessarily want everybody to go out and buy a bunch of dollars and sell their gold. And, you know, the, that, I just want to educate people. I mean, I, there, there's really no big upside for me is, you know, going on Twitter or going to conferences and going to interviews and pounding the table saying the dollar's going higher, other than the fact that, because I've already got, my, my client's money's already allocated. I, I don't really need more clients. If I get more clients, that's great, but I don't need more clients. Um, but I feel like there's a lot of people out there who just either don't have the full picture or the picture that they do have is not completely correct. And, you know, the simple reality is, is if I do my job really, really well, rich people stay rich, you know, and that's, I don't know that there's a lot of that I'm really helping the world by just doing my job. But if I can educate some people along the way, and I can help them think through what's going on, and I can, you know, maybe help one or two people kind of survive the chaos that I think is coming, then maybe that's worth doing, right? And maybe that is changing the world a little bit or helping the world a little bit. And so anyway, that's kind of a very long answer to your first question. But anyway, that, that's kind of where it's at. 
if I can just respond to, to one thing, the uh, yeah. love the term financial justice warrior. Um, for, for some years, I've had a, a different term for something I think is very similar. And I think of it as a funny thing happened along the way, dot, dot, dot. And that is, you know, everybody starts out assuming that the dollar is money and money means the dollar because, the, you know, whether they call it education or whether we call it propaganda, you know, it begins from the time you're getting your mother's milk. Yeah. You know, and you go to Google Images and you search for money and you get endless pages of, you know, rectangular pieces of paper with green ink on them. You know, people holding fistfuls of it and a crisp one and then the sheets coming off the printing presses. But you don't see gold coins anywhere. Yeah. And so everyone just kind of assumes that. And then one day, those of us that, you know, come to gold have this realization, oh, shit, this thing is unsound. And it's unstable. Yeah. And, and, you know, the debt is growing exponentially in the printing market or whatever it is. That first realization and um you know the impulse is go buy some gold okay so so we do that and then that's where the funny thing happens along the way now it's you know cheering for gold to go up rather yeah. than any kind of monetary advocacy instead of thinking about um you know how is the system broken how do we fix it what comes next what's the right monetary system and what's the next monetary system instead it's gold go up and it's, and it's very perverse because it's go up in terms of the thing that you've now defined as not money. So money is gonna go up in terms of not money. So how do you measure money? Well, in terms of not money, obviously. Um, and uh, what's the purpose of it going up? So you can sell it and make more of the not money that you just said was gonna be hyperinflated by tomorrow morning. Yeah. And you know, if you go deep into the conspiracy, the bowels of the gold conspiracy movement, you know, these people will publish um, you know, a date or in one case, I'm trying to remember, this guy published a number, it would be like 173 on his website. That's the only thing it said. And then like five days later, it would be, you know, 100 and, what, 173, 168. And then everybody would start to notice he has some sort of countdown, you know, and all the rumors would swirl that, oh yeah, you know, his peeps in, in Beijing or DC or whatever, they know about the coming, you know, whether it's gonna be re reset or a signal failure, there's all these terms that yeah. use for this. And these dates always come and go. Um, yeah. And then all they do is they either just quietly pull the site. There was one I actually, um, I, I downloaded the entire site for offline use. I figured I might want it as proof. Um, and, and, and I didn't end up using it for anything. I don't really want to call people out per se, but it's a very well-known guy um, who comes across as very sophisticated as multiple best-selling books. And, um, he had the site that was talking about, and it is this deadpan voice. I'm here to tell you that it's a terrible, catastrophic event. <laughs> Anyways, it was like June 30th of that particular year, which is 2015 or 2017 or something like that. And then I, I, I became curious about it. Like, first of all, just how much do you have to click through to get to what is the actual proposition, which is subscribe yeah. to a newsletter or buy a book or something. And, um, and then also I was curious, what are they gonna do on July 1? When this thing, this this magical event that he's yeah. predicted doesn't happen. So, anyways, I was like, I set a calendar thing so that I could come back July one. And what they had done was they reset. There was nothing in the audio that <laughs> said the date. They just reset. The, there's something on the page that said, and now it was reset to December thirty one. So they pushed it off by six months. And I was like, hmm, this would be an interesting game. I came back in January. Oh yeah, look, they reset it again. And um, so anyways, a funny thing happens along, along the way. People go from advocacy of the next monetary system to, you know, rolling the dice at the craps table, you know, crying out, baby needs a new pair of shoes yeah. while, they, while they roll them bones. And, um, you know, I, I think it's the same thing and, and, and very blinding, obviously. I, I love your, um, your point about, you kind of knew it was right because you hated it and you, you were only concluding yeah. reluctantly. Uh, I, I think there's, there's a, uh, a temptation to fall for the convenient theory, the one that just makes everything so nice and neat and you don't have to challenge any, any of your premises. It's just right there and it's just so nice and neat and wrapped with a bow that um, the more tempting it is, the more that you should be skeptical. And if you're drawn to it reluctantly kicking and streaming, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't still strive for intellectual rigor, but it's an interesting litmus test. I don't want to believe this. I hate this. Yeah. Yeah, yet, yeah. 
you know, I, I've and never I read this. I read this great book uh, several years ago now, and I just I just presented part of it at a conference a month ago. But it's basically about uh, it, it's more about psychology and stuff. And, and there's these studies that have been done that has shown that the feeling of certainty, like when you're absolutely certain about something, it's actually a, a, an emotional response like love or hate. Like you don't really choose who you fall in love with. You don't really necessarily choose who you hate. It's just a it's a it's a natural response, but it doesn't necessarily have anything to do with logic or the facts of the matter. It, it actually um, it actually has nothing to do with that. It, it's literally a emotion. So whenever I'm certain about something or whenever I'm really, really sure of something, that's when that scares me the most. Because And again, it didn't used to because I thought, oh, that, that I'm really right, right? And so now whenever I hear people like make like black and white statements and absolute certainty, I always, and even myself, I catch myself doing it too. And I have to like pump the brakes a little bit because um, I always say like in, in, in investing and in capital markets and then, you know, I mean, there is no certainty. It, it, the minute you're certain, you're dead. Um, you, you may be highly, uh, have a high conviction and you may be right, but there are no guarantees in this business. And so um, anyway. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think there can be certainty about economic law but that doesn't translate into certainty about what the price of a certain instrument is. No, going. that that's a and good that's way not. of putting it. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, you know, that, that, people, that's a better way of putting it. That's people accuse the Austrian it. school all the time of, oh, well, if, if, if your economics is so right, why aren't you all multi-billionaires trading? Yeah. And it's like, you know, we, we can tell you that marginal utility diminishes. That doesn't yeah. mean that the price of coffee is gonna go up 20% by next week. Right. Right. Maybe. Right. But um, you know, there's a lot of variables in the real world, and margin utility is only one of them. And supply shortages and logistics, you know, chain, uh, you know, issues are also other factors. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, things are things are very messy in markets. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, anyways, uh, uh, this is this is fascinating. This idea of of uh, financial justice is going to get vindicated by betting on the right asset. Well, and I think there's, I think that that's, that's part of it too. And I, again, I think this is where, especially in the gold world, but it happens in all markets. So I'm, I'm not singling out the gold world here. It's just that I, I see it there. I saw it a lot in crypto, still see it a lot in crypto is the emotional attachment that people get to their investments. Um, and I think a large part of it is the fact that they believe, and perhaps they're right, maybe they are, maybe they're not, but they believe that they're doing this for the greater good, right? Or they've convinced themselves yeah, yeah, yeah. That, it, that it's for the greater good. And, and they deserve to get rich along the way since they are doing it for the greater good. In other words, I don't think that these proponents would be doing it if they would not be out there fighting for justice as much if there wasn't a pot of gold, quote unquote, <laughs> being rainbow, right? Um, if they were doing it strictly for the, um, you know, for for the moral reasons or for the, you know, the the social good. I don't think they would do it with such rigor. But because they believe, because they've discovered this truth, and that they now want to share this truth with the rest of the world, that they will be rewarded at the end of the road. And yes. again, maybe maybe that's right, and maybe it's not. But I think I think that's why it gets very cloudy and why it gets very emotional. The psychology of it. I was going to say it reminds yeah. me of. Um, uh, you know, people to confuse revenge and justice. Yeah, no, you know, exactly. Yeah. They, get a yeah. they get a job at a shitty company and, you know, things don't really work out that well. And then, yeah. you know, when they quit, you know, they have to try to go delete the entire database and they have to go badmouth the company on every yeah. website. And, the, you know, they're like cruising for what they, and in their mind, they, they tell themselves it's justice. Yeah. When in fact, it's just revenge. Yeah. And it's well, the same. Know, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, there's another part of it, too. There's another part of it, too. Um, and, and I'll I, I fully acknowledge this side of it as well, is that, you know, for the people who have recognized that the system is unstable and for the people who have bought gold and silver or whatever it is, and if and when they are still around, when the day comes that the system comes down and they make a lot of money, however you define that. As a result, they will deserve that as well, right? I mean, that's capitalism. If you 
place, if you allocate capital in a way that others don't recognize, and then your what you think is going to happen eventually happens, you, 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 that's capital. You get rewarded for that. You get rewarded for taking that risk. So I'm not saying that the gold and silver people won't be right. I'm, I am, I actually think that they will be right. Um, I, th I think it's the journey along the way that I have the biggest problem with, as opposed to the, the end game. Oh, that's, that's a really good point that, um, you could be right in the end, but there's a lot of twists and turns and, uh, yeah. you know, drawdowns in the bull market, if you want to think of it that way that um, yeah. you know, can be distracting. And then to be early, if you're too early, that's almost, again, in, in a financial market sense, not in an economic sense, yeah. but in a financial market sense, to be too early is, is indistinguishable from being wrong. That's right. In, in, my, business, in my business, that's, that's just being wrong. Now, if you're, if you're writing research or if you're you know, a newsletter or if you have you know, if you're just an individual and every month you take a percent of your check and you put it into the gold coins and you stick it away, that's fine. But that's not that 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 that's much different than what I do as a as someone who manages money for other people. That's right. That's that's a very very uh, key distinction. I actually have a question for you, Keith. Um, so I that's, that's the first I've, come come on our, come on our podcast. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. Right, well, no, ahead. but no, but I, I'm really curious because I think. I, is monetary metals about 10 years old? Um, yes, 2012 is. Uh, okay, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. So as I, I remember coming across you right around, yeah, right around that time. And I had never kind of come across you before that. And I remember initially, even from the beginning, you were a little different than a lot of the other people that I came across in the gold world. And I always thought that this guy's pretty measured. He kind of comes at it a different way. Doesn't seem as emotional about it. And then, to be honest, I was probably more emotional about it at the time. And so I was probably wondering why is this guy not quite so emotional about it. <laughs> but did you were? How did you get exposed to the gold world, and what made you ultimately come into it? Because I, I feel like you've kind of been the same for the full, you know, ten or twelve years that I've been following. I don't, I don't feel like you made some big transformation but may maybe your transformation took place before or after or maybe it never did i'm just i'm just curious like what what drove you to the gold world to begin with so um you know a little bit about i guess my personal backstory so um i was your classic computer nerd in high school um and went off to um after a brief misadventure with uh with healthcare um went off to computer science school um, which was my love and my passion, dropped out of computer science school because uh, I felt that there was nothing left to offer me at the undergraduate level. I was already doing you know, graduate level projects, um, got very briefly got a job developing video games and then uh, started my own company, which was called Diamondware in uh, 1994. Uh, spent 14 years building that up. I guess the first five or six were really just learning about business. Um, and developing a business model and then settling on the business model of 3D audio for voice communications. Um, sold that company to Nortel Networks. The transaction closed August 19, 2008. Uh, we were, as a, historical, <laughs> as a historical footnote, we were the last acquisition Nortel ever did is they spiraled into bankruptcy uh, and by uh, January of 09 filed bankruptcy. Um, did you get cash problem. or stock? It was cash. There was no no stock. Oh, good, good. I got a I got a little bit caught up in you know there were earnouts and other things yeah, yeah. that um, you know made it more complicated. But I have no I have no complaints about the deal financially. Intellectually, it was very frustrating because I built all this you know technology that ended up getting dropped on the floor, which still sits today, uh, you know being totaled and used. Three D voice should have been in the Pantheon with, you know, color TV and, and microwave ovens, garage door openers. It should have been one of those things that once you experience it, it should become ubiquitous and you never want to. So my, my personal hell is I have to do meetings all day that lack the technology and the solutions that, that I built and, and patented and led a team building, you know, 15, you know, 20 years ago. That's my, that's my personal hell. Anyways, financially it was pretty good. And um, as you can imagine, you know, I, I, I sat there and said, okay, I don't want to make any major financial moves, investments, purchases, whatever, for 90 days. I just want to let this settle because it was a life-changing um, sum of money. And that happened to be the 90 days that everything blew up. I mean, the overlap with 
the financial crisis was almost perfect, almost like there was fate or something like that. My investment banker, who by the way, was diagnosed with late stage cancer in uh, July and went to the hospital and said, gentlemen, uh, here's the things you need to worry about. And now you should assume you'll never talk to me again on this earth because uh, you know, I have to focus on my health. Um, there was one weekend where he had the doctors gave him 50-50 whether he would live. He called me up in October of, of uh, 2008 and said, Keith, you're the luckiest beep man in the world. <laughs> the guy who just survived cancer. And he lived after that another um, you know, six or seven years and, and went on to do all the things that was bucket list that he wanted to do and everything else. He called me up to say that because of the timing of how everything you know, and, and the timing of a deal like that, it's up to like lawyer summer vacations and, you, you know, just all kinds of things that are outside your control. And that's that's how that worked out. So anyway, so that fall, I started to obsessively, I, I use the term like a moth to a flame. Just, I was just drawn into this morass of what is wrong with the system. Um, nothing they said on TV made any sense. I, I got all the famous people's books in you know in the space and it's like no one is really getting to the root of this and like you i was going to say earlier when you said um you know, something about your uh, uh conviction and um i forget how you put it uh you know and, and oh and you're not sure whether you're right but you're asking the question um I, I i felt nobody was asking even the right questions and i came across this old hungarian professor named fekete um, and at the time I said, well, I don't know if he's right or not, but he's the only one even asking the question, let alone trying to offer an answer to it. And um, so then I saw he was giving a course in Hungary. I was like, okay, you know, I have essentially unlimited vacation time coming to me because of the way the deal worked out. Um, so, uh, um, you know, I flew to Hungary and I, I took his course and, um, you know, with, with no intention of, you know, going back to school or anything else, just because I just yeah. found it interesting. I saw a picture of him. I said, okay, he's clearly, you know, elderly. I don't, you know, I don't know how long he's for this earth. And I, I want to meet somebody like this uh, while I've got the opportunity. Anyway, I took another course and another course and I started to write essays. And then of course I shared my essays with my professor. And there was a point he said, well, I think you have enough material for a PhD here, dissertation, which was kind of a joke because that was a six page paper. My dissertation ended up being like 126 pages or something by the time it was done. Um, but anyways, I, I came to it from a study of monetary science, which is what he called it, yeah. and really thinking about what, what, how a gold system works in a free market. And then second, so that was first, not not trading, you know, markets at all. Then second was putting my entrepreneurial hat on because I consider myself to be an entrepreneur and not an academic saying, okay, how do you roll out the red carpet? How do you pave a path? And there's been a lot of economists, Mises, obviously, Hayek, a lot of others who said, we need to get to the gold standard, guys. This is gonna be a real big disaster. But nobody figured out how to roll out that red carpet and get there. And um, I had one insight, which was, um, it's the interest rate that regulates flow, you know, circulation of gold and if the interest rate's zero, I used to use a picture of like a plumbing system with a jack valve. You know, if the interest yeah. rate's zero, it can't, it can't, even if you had a working gold coin system, it would seize up and stop working if the interest rate ever went to zero. Um, and um, so then, I, you know, two and two clicked together and I was like, you have to pay a return on gold and gold. And if you can do that, that's a value proposition that people will respond to. Um, although the whole gold world told me that um, you know, I was an idiot for for trying to do that, um, yeah, yeah. and um, and of course the mainstream people all, also told me I was an idiot. But that's obviously a value proposition that makes sense. And um, if you can do that, if you can scale it, you create the gold standard and a bottom up sort of way. So in 2012, we weren't ready to pay interest on gold as such, but um, we started a little hedge fund to trade the gold silver ratio. But yeah. the innovation there was to keep the books in gold. And then, you know, management success fee was paid based on increasing the value of the of the holding in gold ounce terms rather than um, in dollar terms. You know, recognizing what the dollar price and they go up and everything. But if all I do for my client is buy gold and the dollar price goes up, I haven't added any value. Yeah. That, that was that was what we did there. Ultimately decided to wind that down because that wasn't 
where the business was as as this fixed income um you know line is really where, where it's at so that was that was my how i came to the space was from a monetary economics perspective and uh, you know like everybody i mean i bought gold back in those days um yeah but I, but I always kept thinking of it in terms of, you know, you have to measure the dollar in terms of gold. You know, gold is the lighthouse, the dollar is the ship, which is both yeah. le leaking and tossing around in, in the volatile seas. You can't stand there on the deck of the ship and say, why is the lighthouse going up and down and mostly up? That's, right. that's a, it's an incorrect vantage point, although it's the one we're all trained, obviously, to, 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 to view. So that was that was my um, kind of history, uh, how I came to all this. Got it. Got it. Cool. Well, I knew uh, I, I knew that you had studied under Fekete, but I wasn't quite sure. And yeah, anyway, maybe you've told me that in the past, and I just forgot it. But uh, I appreciate you sharing that because I, I was always curious, uh, you know, how that happened. Yeah, it was it was kind of an unusual set of circumstances that all came together um serendipitously yes yeah. he, he was giving that course you know it wasn't that long after that um he basically retired in 2012 so i had enough time to go through um you know the coursework enough time to write the dissertation enough time for him uh and he invited um professor juan ramon Raglio from uh, university juan carlos in madrid to be the other examiner of my dissertation and then uh, Professor Fekete, as far as I know, only ever granted two PhDs to myself and one other guy. And then he retired. You know, he, by this point, he was in his mid 80s. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, and slowing down and not able to, to do it anymore. And um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Why don't you, you know, we talked about this term milkshake. I'm sure yeah. most of the people who, uh, uh, obviously, everyone who follows you on Twitter would know what that term is. Probably most of the people who follow me on Twitter would know what it is, but maybe yeah. a lot of people listening to this podcast don't necessarily know. So why don't you, um, you know, take a couple of minutes and and just yeah. say out like what is this theory, and um, how does it work? Got it. So I'm going to start off by explaining that the reason I came up with this analogy in the first place is I manage money for individuals, so I'm not managing money for big pension funds or endowments. Most of the people that are sitting on the other side of the desk from me that are my clients are very smart, extremely successful. And if they wanted to be focused on finance, they would probably do very well. But for whatever reason, that's not what they do. So they're not versed in the same type of language and acronyms that I am. And, you know, they don't know the difference between a credit default swap and, a, you know, a T-bill, for, for, <laughs> to be honest, you know, that's that's why they hired me. Um, and so whenever I'm explaining what I think is going to happen, I've always got to come up with a kind of a layman's way of saying what I think is going to happen. Because if I go in there and start talking about interest rates and, you know, uh, monetary policy, their, their eyes are going to glaze over and they're going to fire me. So <laughs> I don't want that to happen. So I've always got to kind of, kind of just come up with a simple way of explaining what I think is going to happen and why we should do what we're going to do. And so, you know, kind of around the same time that I was talking earlier, I came to this uh, awareness of the way the system is rather than the way I wanted it to be. Um, I had to start explaining why we should continue to own gold because I do think we should continue to own gold as part of the um, uh, overall portfolio. But I also had to explain why I couldn't predicate my entire gold thesis on gold or my gold thesis on the dollar going to zero, which anybody who's ever gone, any new gold investor who ever goes to a gold conference, the entire conference is pretty much built around the fact that the dollar is going to get inflated away because of the you know fiscal profligacy of the United States government, right? That is the base case. Now there's other reasons as well, but that is the bedrock on which the whole gold thesis is built. Um, and that's fine. I think that is that is appropriate, but it doesn't mean it's going to happen right away, right? And so I had to explain why we needed to keep gold in the portfolio as you know insurance or as part of diversification, but also I had to explain why, you know, the the primary reason that most people see to see to own gold is not my primary view, and in fact, I think it's the opposite. And so that's where the milkshake theory came up with. And, I, and ultimately what the milkshake theory is, it's a framework for the way I see 
a global sovereign debt and sovereign currency crisis playing out. Now, perhaps that will play out over a number of months. I think it will play out over a number of years. And I think there will be starts and stops. I think we're probably in the late 2020s before this all gets rattled, you know, settled. And it might not even be settled by then. Um, but but, but the, the reason I say that is this is not something I think that, you know, the dollar has a big move up over the next six weeks and then it's over. I, I don't think it's gonna be that way. Um, but essentially, if we, I mean, we, we could probably go back 100 years, but to keep it simple, if we just go back 15 years to the global financial crisis, 2008, 2009 time period, ever since then, global central banks around the world have had to provide um, an enormous amount of liquidity, stimulus, uh, incentives, however you want to describe what's gone on since then, you know, the QE, the money printing, da 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 And so the the... The example I used was that's the milkshake. The world governments and the monetary authorities, you know, provided this big milkshake, financial milkshake to, to the global economy. But due to a number of reasons, which primarily trace back to the design of the system itself, is the US and the US dollar has the straw. So, you know, we meaning the US, when I say we, the US, I believe, is going to drink up that milkshake, regardless of where it's at. Doesn't matter if that milkshake was milked in Perth, Australia, or in Durban, South Africa. I think it's that liquidity is ultimately going to flow into the dollar and into the United States markets. And as it flows into the United States markets, then that allows us to extend the game longer than everybody else. And as that liquidity leaves those other areas, it puts those other areas into crisis uh, because at the end of the day, in cash flow in, in, in investing, everything comes down to cash flow. You either need to have a stock of cash, and if you don't have a stock of cash, then you need a flow of cash coming through. Um, and so, as that liquidity leaves those other areas, I think that they are going to come under extreme pressure. Um, and we're already starting to see this in places like Turkey and, you know, Peru and Ecuador and El Salvador. Uh, you're seeing it in Sri Lanka. You're even starting to see it in Europe and Japan in some, in, in some cases. So anyway, the, the, the thesis is that the, the dollar will get strong as global capital flows into it as a safe haven. And again, you, you may think that it's, it doesn't deserve the safe haven. Um, status, but I argue that whether it deserves it or not is irrelevant. It is based on the design of the system. And so as that as that plays out, I think the dollar gets stronger, which attracts even more capital to it, and it becomes this vicious circle. And I think the dollar goes a lot, lot higher. And um, on, on a relative basis, I think the United States, despite all its flaws, despite all its mistakes despite all the bad policies i think will weather the storm better than most other places and then kind of at the end of the theory is that the dollar will get so strong they i believe they will have to reset the system in some way um, whether they come up with a new design or whether they have another plaza accord which you know devalues the the, the strength of the dollar i think something will have to be done um, to relieve that pressure and at that, and then at that, that point, you're not going to want to own dollars anymore. You're probably not going to want to be invested in the United States. You're probably want to go and allocate your capital to those places that have been beat up and deprived of liquidity, because then I think the the tide will flow back that other way. So that is as the where the, the name came from a movie where it was a, there's a movie called There Will Be Blood where this you know oil baron, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, was negotiating uh, a piece of land with the guy that owned the land next to him and the guy wanted him to buy the land and he said I don't need to buy your land all I got to do is stick a straw down into the ground and I can drink your oil he said I can drink your milkshake and I think that's essentially <laughs> what's going to happen I, I think that uh, the U.S. is going to drink the rest of the world's milkshake um, you know Japan is still mixing the milkshake Europe is still mixing the milkshake a lot of places, you know, China still mixing. A lot of places are still mixing the milkshake, but we we're the ones drinking it. So, I, I think that that is going to play out. So that that is that is the explanation of what the term milkshake means. You know, there's there's a there's a real perversity to you can see the perversity in the design and the system. Oh, absolutely. That everybody around the world, because they owe dollars, 
when people say, why is the dollar, you know, have, have value? Oh, it's just a matter of everybody waking up one day and realizing it's shit and then repudiating it. I'm like, don't yeah. think in terms of the small trader who says, should yeah. I own a dollar? Should I own this? Should I own that? Most of the bigger players in the system have no choice. They owe lots That's and lots of dollars. And the problem is their, their, their revenue is in Turkish lira. Their revenue is in South African rand or whatever. And um, they, they have to make a very, you know, they're making a very firm bid on the dollar as they're desperately trying to generate as much revenue as they can in their local currency to then trade it for dollars so they can service their debt. Right. And um, of course, the people in those countries, as they see their own currencies going down, start to think, well, I should open up a USD account. And every response to this only just further adds perversity on top of perversity on top of diversity. And, um, how yeah, and I think, I think, I think the key, the key for me, and may, maybe this will help again, people that have not heard this before and that are kind of new to this, and that are listening to this. Um, the, the key for me was getting an understanding of the Euro dollar market. So again, for people that are new, there, there's two dollar markets. There's a domestic U S dollar market, but then there's a market for dollars outside the United States that's bigger than the market of dollars inside the United States. So dollars that exist outside the United States are Euro dollars, dollars that exist inside the United States are dollars, but the, the market for dollars outside the United States is orders of magnitude bigger than the one inside the United States. And so when I say there's all this debt out there that's denominated in dollars, a lot of times the argument I will get back will be, well, what if the rest of the world just defaults on those dollars, then the US won't get their money back. And the point I, I, I always point out to them is the U.S. did not lend these dollars to them. This is France loaning dollars to Turkey. This is Japan loaning dollars to Australia or whoever it is. But my, the, the point is, is that financial institutions, shadow banks, uh, you know, even commercial you know, businesses that do vendor financing, they will extend credit in dollars and both the lender and the borrower are located outside the United States. So if the rest of the world suddenly decides not to pay back their U.S. dollar debt or their, the, the credit that's been extended to them in U.S. dollars, they're not defaulting on the United States. They're defaulting on themselves. In other words, the rest of the world is defaulting on the rest of the world. And so it's not that it can't happen. It's just that that doesn't necessarily hurt the United States, or at least it doesn't hurt them as bad as it hurts the people that have lent that money outside the United States. And and then people will say, well, what if they just uh, don't, want, you know, if everybody, if they move to another system and they don't use dollars, then that would hurt the dollar. Okay, there's truth in that, but they would all have to figure out what other system they were going to go to. That system would have to be designed and implemented. Everybody would have to trust it and they would have to do it while they were fighting a war with the United States. Right. And I just don't think that that's viable without a lot of volatility along the way. I'm not saying it can't happen. But I think it would be an extremely volatile event if that happened. And I think in the short term, the dollar would go a lot higher. And again, for all the reasons that, that I've discussed before. So, you know, the euro dollar market is really key to it. And, and for those who are saying, yeah, well, you know, I, I wouldn't want the dollars anyway, because, you know, they're just they're they're going to be worthless. And the, the analogy I would use here is if you're living in the United States and you get a job in Germany, and now you fly over to Berlin and you get an apartment and you get a car and you get a post office box and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, if you had $100,000 and you're safe back in the United States, you're not just going to burn that $100,000. You still want that money, even though you're not going to be using dollars anymore. You still want it. You still want that asset. So the idea that it doesn't matter, then you're just going to leave those reserves behind and that you don't care that they go to zero is it's it's just not reality. It works great in a presentation of why the dollar is bad, but it doesn't work well in reality. So uh, again, the idea that ever, the whole world is just going to leave dollars behind and move on to some new system, and they're all going to do great, and the U.S. is going to go up in smoke is just to me it's fiction. So I was going to say so you know if you look at at the balance sheets of most of the major players in the rest of the world. They owe dollars. If they default on those dollar debts, their assets are seized because the, the counterparty isn't Uncle Sam, where arguably maybe the rest of the world could agree, let's all screw Uncle Sam, but the counterparty is the Bank of France or whatever. 
um, or BNP Paribas. Um, so if they default on that side, then their assets are, are seized and they're out of business. And on the on the asset side, you know, it's an asset that's performing well relative to their local currency or any other currency they could conceive of. And yeah. so they may hate it, but they'll grin and bear it because, yeah. because of that reason. Um, I, I was going to make a point about, um, you know, just, just reset and just change the system. And um, a lot of people may be aware that there was an attempt to do that for language that a bunch of smart people got together and defined an artificial language that nobody spoke, by the way. Um, but we're all going to speak it because it's a better language, and that's Esperanto. Oh, and, yeah. um, you know, it didn't work, obviously. And um, the reason is the network effect. Yeah. Do not yeah. underestimate the network effect. That's right. So, so this the, term, do the dollar is the biggest network in the world. Right, by far, it's not even by remote. By far, it's, it's not even remotely close, yeah. So, so the network effect was a term coined by, I can't remember what his name was, at 3Com, um, uh, uh, Jesus, uh, Metcalf, Metcalf's yeah, Law. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was selling um, network cards for PCs. For, this is Ethernet. And um, he came up with this graph they put on a slide to this day, I'm not sure anybody really knows whether this is exactly true or not, but he said um, the, uh, um, the value of the network is proportional to, was it the square of the number of nodes? Yeah, um, I don't remember. It said something like that. And everybody just sort of accepted that because, you know, companies would say, okay, well, <laughs> we'll buy one, we'll buy one, one, one Ethernet card. No, no, yeah. you got to buy more than one. You have to hook everybody up. Anyways, he had something there, obviously, you know, whether it's the square, the cube, factorial, whatever, there's some, there's some real value there. And um, for good or for ill, all economic, you know, calculation is performed in dollars. You know, if somebody from Germany is buying something from somebody in Turkey, they want to know the dollar value of the transaction. Um, you know, I've met pension funds in Malaysia. You know, you might think, okay, it's a Malaysian thing, right? The pension fund would have a balance sheet denominated in ringgit as the um, Malaysian currency. No, it's denominated in dollar. <laughs> You know, Putin yeah. is selling oil in rubles or yuan or, or whatever, uh, rupees, but everyone knows that a barrel of oil is worth X, X amount and there's a discount for euros oil, obviously, but it's all dollar calculations. Yep. So how do, how do you just reset that? How do you just say, you know, if we could only get 7 billion people on this planet to all fly to New York at the same moment, and then one, two, three jump, we could knock the planet out of its orbit or something crazy like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Well, how do you do that? Yeah. And the answer is it's 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 completely intractable, yeah. completely beyond uh, comprehension what it would take to really do that. Um, when you get into the logistics of it, you get into everybody's self interest. Yeah. Uh, you know why that network well, is think, there. Yeah, and, and as part of that network effect, and this is this is what I would say to, to again people that are out there that are listening to this that are investors that are allocating money. Um, they're trying to make more money. Again, there's some, probably some people on here who, again, who are financial justice warriors. They're trying to advocate for gold, totally fine. But if you are trying to increase the value of your 401k or increase the value of your investment account or whatever, you're, if you were trying to make money, however you define that to be, then the second part of this is not, uh, when you're investing in markets is to understand that in many ways, there's what will play out fundamentally over a very long time period. But then there's also the common knowledge game where you are basically betting of what everybody else is going to do. Instead of what they should do, what is everybody else going to do? And what I mean by that is you may think the dollar is trash and you may think that everybody should go buy gold. But does everybody else think that? Because until they think that, gold's not going higher, right? And so in the same way that you know, think about all the, the things that happened over the last couple of years as a result of COVID, you know, whether it was the lockdowns, whether it was the mask mandates, a number of different mandates came down from above that said, you have to do this. And how many people hated it? How many people pushed back, right? A lot of people just complied, but a lot of people pushed back. Now, let's pretend that we went to a gold conference and everybody in the room was a gold advocate. And then Janet Yellen comes up on stage and says, we are moving tomorrow to a seashell standard. Would everybody in that room just accept it and go on the seashell standard? No. Well, 
Now think about all the people in the world that are not at that gold conference and have never even heard of gold. And not only have never even heard of gold, have no desire to change to a gold standard. Well, when Janet Yellen comes out and says, okay, we are going to a gold stand tomorrow. You don't think anybody's gonna push back. You think the whole world's just gonna say, okay, no problem. Then there's not gonna be any volatility. Now mm -hmm. I would actually, I would actually argue that gold would be one of the most accepted things that people would agree to. But the idea that there's not going to be any pushback and everybody is just going to automatically accept this return to the gold standard and there is not going to be volatility is to me just the height of hypocrisy because you, you, you're not going to do it yourself. You're not going to accept a mandate from heaven <laughs> or yelling, however you want to describe that, uh, coming down from the top. But you want everybody else to accept the mandate from the top if it you know, complies with what you think should happen. And so, you know, again, you know, until the rest of the world decides on their own that we need to get into gold because either the euro or the yen or the dollar or whatever else, you know, is just no longer worth it. You know, gold is not, in my opinion, is not gonna to do what a lot of people think it's going to. I do think that day will come. And I do think gold will go much, much higher. But, but, but that is why it might not happen right away. And that's why it might not be this imminent event, you know, like you were talking about earlier, the countdown, 60 days, 54 days, 43 days. Um, anyway, that's, that, that's, I'll get off my soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, a lot, a lot of good points there. Um, and the Bitcoiners are, are even bigger, uh, yeah. you know, sinners in, in that particular yeah. regard. Um, but, yeah, and then you know, I always feel like I need to say this. I say this as a huge advocate for gold. I don't want people to rush out and sell all their gold. And if you don't own any gold, I think you should go buy some, right? But just recognize that just because you understand that the system is unstable and it will eventually fall does not mean that's going to happen tomorrow. Just keep keep a level head, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Well, too, there's there's probably been there's probably been a lot of martyrs, and and. Oh. And, you know, you talk about fin financial justice warrior, there's been a lot of gold martyrs along the road, right, that have yeah, yeah. sacrificed their wealth waiting for yeah. that day to happen. Yeah. Um, so that's... Well, and, you know, and part of the reason, part of the reason that I probably pound the table as hard as I do, and part of the reason that I continue to go to conferences and speak and continue to do podcasts and do interviews is because... I've met so many people, I would go to these conferences and there would be people that were either in their retirement already or very close to retirement. And in their retirement accounts, they would have 60 or 70% gold miners, right? And these people have just been destroyed. Mm. You know, and the, the very thing that those advocating to put gold miners in your portfolio were trying to protect them against, they would say, don't put your money in the stock market. You could lose 60, 70, 80% of your money. Well, you know what? They did lose 60, 70, 80 percent. It's just they did it in gold miners instead of they did instead of IBM or Netflix or whatever it was. So right. again, I, I everybody should own gold. And I think having gold miners is perfectly acceptable, but keep it within reason. You know, don't go nuts. And yeah, and, and I got and I got I got tired of talking to people who were just praying. They were like, Well, when do you think it will come back? When and right. the reason they were just upset because they were down 60, 70 percent. Right. And, and they needed it to come back to survive. And I, I yeah, the, you know. The problem with that is they took a thesis that turned out not to be right, which is gold to the moon, and then leveraged it. The presumption right. is that gold, gold miners are gold with gearing, yep. which is also an error. Right. They're gold with gearing and a whole bunch of other risks, yeah. uh, most of which are not at all uh, obvious to you know, casual people. Yeah. And um, this is something we talk about, uh, if I just have a, a minute to, to dwell on this, we talk about this a lot with our investors, which is in the dollar world, you have a complete risk return spectrum. On one side, you have holding paper dollar cash, you know, let's say in a safe under the floorboards, and on the opposite extreme, and, and there's no return and no risk. And on the opposite extreme, I guess would be, you know, near-term expiring, you know, at the money call options on a 3X levered ETF, that if you put $100,000 into that and you're right, you can create an intergenerational yeah. fortune, right? right? And every right. at every stop, of, at every grain along the way, it's highly granular, at every step along the way, 
between one extreme and the other, there's an investment for you in the dollar yeah. world. In the gold world, you have gold the metal itself, which in gold terms has no return and no risk. Warren Buffett famously said, you buy a lump of gold, you stick it in your desk drawer, 20 years later, it's still the same lump. Yeah. Um, you know, gold, GLD, gold futures, they're all basically gold. And maybe you add a little bit of leverage to it, but it's still basically gold. Uh, there's no return in gold terms anyway. And then on the opposite extreme, you have the miners. And then you have the major miners, you know, GDX, and then you have the yep. G GDXJ. And then that's the opposite extreme, not quite all the way out to, you know, triple, you know, calls on, on, on 3X leverage ETFs, but pretty far out on the risk return spectrum, you have that. And so people are attracted to the gold miners, not because they know anything about the gold mining sector or gold mining as a business or geology or mine engineering or all these things, not because, you know, and, and I don't mean any offense by this, but they have no real business trying to make that bet because the yeah. risks are numerous and they don't understand it and they don't have, they're not equipped to do the due diligence, you know, properly. And um, they're doing it because they see it as gold with a return versus gold metal, which doesn't. And then the problem is these are businesses that have all sorts of risks, including how they get impacted by uh, the business cycle. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, and then, right, then you end up with a 70%, you know, yeah. loss on, on somebody who's retired and can't make it back. And it, it's tragic. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, the, the, the other part of this that we should probably talk, touch on at least a little bit is what has happened over the last year. So, we, you know, most people probably don't realize this, but the, the dollar index is up close to 20% in the last year or 15 months or whatever it is. Um, and so a year ago, everybody was telling me the, the, the dollar index is never going to go higher. Okay. So now a year later, they'll say, well, the dollar index went higher, but the dollar is not going higher because <laughs> the price of food has gone up and the price of gas has gone up. So they've, they've moved the goalposts a little bit, but that's fine because to a certain extent, they're right there. Okay. And I'll acknowledge that. So, so then I'll get the answer. So they'll say, so it doesn't really matter that the dollar index is going up. If all fiat's being debased, we should just get out of all of fiat. And it doesn't really matter. The dollar index is irrelevant. And that is just for anybody listening who has an open mind, that is completely wrong. Okay. <laughs> It doesn't mean you shouldn't recognize that all fiat is getting debased, but the idea that it doesn't matter and it will have no impact on your portfolio is 100% wrong. And the reason is, is because what we were talking about earlier is all the US dollar debt in the world. When the denominator of a ratio goes up, the value of that ratio goes down. And if so, if somebody has borrowed, if businesses or people have borrowed in dollars and the price of that dollar goes up, now, all of a sudden, they are going to be insolvent. And when they're insolvent, then defaults happen. And when default happens, money disappears. And that's how a depression happens, right? And so if you, if you have any doubts about this, pull up whatever asset you want and go back to March 2020 and look and see what the price of that asset did from March 9th to March 19th. Everything in the world went down. Gold went down or, or started the beginning of end, end of February to the beginning of to the, the, the March 20th. Gold went down, gold miners went down, silver went down, bonds went down, stocks went down, wheat went down, everything went down. And it's because there was a global margin call on the dollar because everything was going down in dollar terms. It doesn't, now that doesn't mean that they didn't recover very quickly. Gold recovered very quickly and, and shot up really high. But in that moment, in that month or that two or three week period, everything gets liquidated. So the idea that the dollar going up versus other fiat, does not impact a portfolio because they're all getting debased is completely wrong. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware of it. It doesn't mean you shouldn't have your portfolio allocated in a way that will do okay as fiat gets debased. But you just do, you just can't say that the dollar index doesn't matter when, you know, to the point we made earlier, it is the biggest network in the world. If you think that the biggest network in the world and the one thing that underlies the entire financial system doesn't matter, well, you probably shouldn't be managing money. Just, just at a very simple, basic level, you know, most of the companies in S and P five hundred have revenues globally, and those revenues right. are denominated in the local currency. So, if you're Coca Cola, you're selling Coke to people in France; it's in euros. You're selling Coke to people in yep. South Africa; it's in rand. 
the value of that euro and the value of that rand in dollars, which is how Coke states its earnings, yep. its share price is in dollars, and you can measure the ratio of its share price divided by its earnings. Its earnings, I don't know what percentage it is for Coke, but a lot of these companies, yeah. global, global revenues are either a majority of their earnings or at least uh, you know, 40, 50%. And now suddenly 40, 50, 60% of their total earnings are going down, not because the business is doing any differently than, uh, than the U.S. business, but it's denominated in currencies that are, that are doing worse. Then yep. those, those, com those companies are going to have huge downside earnings surprises. Yep. And if you think right. that's going to be good for their share price, you got another thing coming. Right. Um, and uh, there's a lot more to it than just that. You also refer to how you know, companies globally are short the dollar because they borrowed it. You're short something that's going up. Yeah, how's that going to work out? <laughs> um, not well, not I, well. I love there was. I saw Russell Napier talk in London uh, one time several years back. I love this quote from. I don't know if he's ever used this before or since, but um, I saw it live when he said, "The equity, equity is the thin line of hope between the liability and the asset." Ah, that's interesting. Right, so if the yeah, liability, yeah. if the liability is going up, what's the equity worth? Yeah. And he makes the point zero. Yeah. If, yeah. if the debt's not going to be- That's a good line. That's a good, I've never heard that line before. That's a good If the debt's not going to be repaid in full, the equities were zero. And um, of course, you know, there can be a thin thin line of hope uh, as there are certainly in, in uh, some stocks even now. Um, yeah. So there's a lot of perversity here. I feel like we could do a part two of this. And yeah, we should probably about, do that. And talk about- <laughs> The world needs a, a theory of speculation that, okay, you know, dollar to go to zero, great, wonderful thesis, long-term, whatever. Um, if you would have asked me back in 2012, I would have said five to seven years. Did say, in fact, yep. at that time, five to seven years. And obviously here we are more than seven years after that. And not only hasn't the dollar gone to zero, it's getting stronger, um, you know, but yep. how, does, how does speculation set price? Is, is a very interesting uh, thing that um, I certainly haven't written a lot about that, and I know I need to write, but it might be interesting to have a, a real-time yeah. chat with you, because I'm sure you've thought about that as well. You know, why hasn't gold gone to $5,000, um, you know, in this environment? If that's, if it's obvious that that's where it has to go at the end of the day, why is today not moving towards where it yeah, is yeah. the end of the day? Um, yeah. Be very interesting. But um, I think uh, we've uh, more than used up our time slot. And well, I'm happy to, to uh, yeah, I'm happy to do part two anytime. I appreciate you having me on. It's always fun talking to you. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks for coming on. This has been a blast. I'm sure we'll talk again soon. Sounds good. Thanks for the invite, guys. This episode was brought to you by Monetary Metals. Monetary Metals is a different kind of gold company. Others buy and sell gold. Monetary Metals operates the gold yield marketplace, a platform of products that offer a yield on gold paid in gold to investors and institutions, and our gold financing simplified, reliable financing denominated in gold with a built-in hedge for gold using and gold producing businesses. To learn more, visit www.monetary-metals.com. See you next time.